thank you all. Thanks for inviting me. Although I don't uh, know who actually came up with the idea to invite me. Perhaps uh, that will come uh, later. <coughs> this morning I was uh, milking the cows and feeding them together with my father. One of the cows was in heat, coming in heat, so we were discussing, we always do, what bull we would uh, pick to serve her. So they said, hey, why don't you wait for the, for the meeting this afternoon and perhaps you have the answer uh, afterwards. But to be honest, after having uh, listened to these presentations, uh, it's still a little bit difficult. I feel a little bit underdressed, so to speak, in this, uh, in this uh, community. But hey, I will tell you how, uh, how we breed at home and how uh, my father has done that for the, for the past 50 years. He's now... Uh, uh, 77, but still uh, in good shape, still milking cows. He was a little younger here, but this gives a little impression of the, of the environment where we have them in. Uh, not the most common environment anymore, but uh, we still milk them in, the, in a tie barn based uh, or housed on straw. But uh, uh, I'll not uh, go into the environment uh, too much because uh, I only have five minutes and uh, so we'll uh, dive into the breeding part uh, right away. We still milk and breed uh, the original Frisian black and whites. So uh, there's no Holstein blood in them and there's no Dutch blood in them either. There's only Frisian blood. So from the little province of Friesland <laughs> up, up in the Netherlands there. Uh, <coughs> that herd book used to be closed for a hundred years, the Frisian herd book. The Dutch herd book was opened, but the Frisian herd book used to be closed from 1880 to the 1980s, I think. After which it was opened up, and most Frisian breeders, or all Frisian breeders, started to use Dutch bulls as well. There were only a few stubborn ones who kept to the Frisians. And my father was already uh, uh, breeding with the Frisians as well, as he was a trainee on one of the most known breeder farms up in Friesland and took home quite a few cows and bulls from him. So we actually have a herd that uh, comes from that, uh, from that farm. Um, so the original Friesian black and whites. <coughs> and as you see, two of the most important traits also for resilience, I think, uh, uh, are on these cows. Uh, this was Kate 108. She, uh, she won the, the Jubilee uh, 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 show back in 1970 it was i think um, one of the most important shows uh, in the world in that time like like the world dairy expo is today that was up in leeward and friesland in that time people from all over the world came uh, to watch that uh, that show and uh, this cow got the grand champion uh, in that time as she was held uh, uh, by my father uh, when he was as a trainee on this uh, farm of the breeder Megma. And as you see, uh, this cow got the excellent score. She also got an excellent score for her udder, which we probably wouldn't give it anymore at this time, but uh, at that time it was a perfect udder. But she also had a, a cross height of one meter 31, which is this height. She was considered a marvelous cow, 100% in balance, the perfect cow at that time, the most efficient cow, and also a resilient cow, because as you see, this cow these cows are dual purpose, have a bit of meat. And I think the dual purpose type cow is easily the most resilient cow uh, that you would uh, uh, need in, in, in times of stress, in times of, uh, 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 well, in times of stress, you, uh, you need a little buffer on the side of the, of the animals. Uh, we consider that uh, a base of resilience. So smaller cows, and a little meat on them, a little body reserves. I think that's just uh, by far the easiest way to breed resilience into our cows nowadays. We've actually gone quite the wrong way for the past 30 years, uh, uh, as I'm considered, because, uh, well, once we started, at least I can talk for Holland, uh, once we started to breed for production, we did for a long time and only selected for production without taking efficiency into account in our breeding indexes, in our ENET indexes for 25 years. There was no efficiency taken in. And if you only select for production, you automatically select for a larger cow. Simple as that. 
if you don't take efficiency into account. And you also, we also did in the ENET calculations like we did, uh, models are nice but not always if you don't do it uh, uh, correctly. In that model, um, we also selected the bull mothers when they were in production for 100 days. So the heifers that, were came in that came into production became the new bull mothers when they were 100 days in production. And um, not looking at the heifers anymore, which heifers would produce the most milk at 100 days? The ones that are able to put their backs, to put the meat, to put the body reserves into milk production. <laughs> the one with the negative energy balance have the highest production at 100 days. So we also automatically selected, sorry, for, yeah, for uh, less body condition scores, eh, for less dual purpose cows. Uh, things, these are two basics that can easily be restored. That's the good thing uh, of, of what we are now, and I think what would be good to breed more resilience into cows. That was an old cow. This is a new cow. So they're still uh, uh, like this. And, uh, well, we breed, with, uh, we breed with her. We breed daughters from her with our own bulls and we breed sons from her with our own bulls. This one was actually at an AI station, but there's little interest in these cows anymore because they don't reach the highest rankings in the genomics. So uh, no AI stations interested uh, for these cows. But the breeding system is simple, yep. We only use our own bulls. These pedigrees are totally homebred. All the animals you see on this pedigree are born in our barn not only the female ones. There's not AI in this pedigree. So uh, using five bulls every year from your best cows, serve the rest of the herd with them, do that for a few generations, and you uh, breed on a practical way a resilient and efficient cow. And I think these cows are bred without computers, so I think it's even possible to do that without computers. We've gone a little bit from this type of cow to these type of cows. And I think uh, uh, this had been the result of, uh, of making a wrong model in the past. We've bred bulls that are actually, the, the one left top is one of us, but the other ones were very, very famous bulls in Holland, used very, very heavily, but I think they're actually just misformed bulls. These, are one, these were one of the most famous bulls in their times. Today we breed with models bulls that should have been culled as a calf. Eh? But this is the no, that is the number one in the world being used very, very heavily. And I think it's just, uh, just uh, the wrong way of breeding. Because everything is dominated by the AI stations and they rule which kind of bulls they're putting in. And uh, uh, farmers just... just uh, uh, Use them. Here's another one. If we start breeding for resilience, this one cannot even reach the ground, but she's one of the highest daughters in the world on TPI. We're going to very, very heavily use this animal as a bull mother and use bulls from her and pump it into the population so we can make models as, as, uh, as, uh, as nice as possible, but it won't, uh, as long as we keep doing that, it won't help to make, uh, to make the good predictions. This is what I would actually like to see. Last picture. We have fundament breeders into the breed, still a few of them, breeding with their own bulls, breeding a family line, breeding a resilient and efficient line with their own bulls. Several breeders do that. AI stations should only be there to distribute semen and not interfere with breeding decisions. Only distribute semen to farmers that use the semen and say, okay, I take a few bulls from the first line, then I take a few bulls from the second line. You have no inbreeding, no line breeding, you have even crossbreeding in the user herds. Let the fundament breeders breed their fundaments, they like it, and don't do it this way. This is what we're doing now. Actually the breeders are using bulls from the AI stations as well. We all have the same genetics and we're all fishing from a very small pool of genetics. And um, it's almost impossible for an AI station to pick bulls from out of that pool. You have to fish in that pool, otherwise you will not have the highest TPIs on your bulls. So these red arrows should be gone. 
and then we can start improving uh, our breeding structure again, I think. Oh, I have so much more to say, but uh, I, uh, I've already been uh, uh, hinted a few times, so I'll let it with this uh, uh, and see what comes up in the discussion. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Um, are there any points of clarification or um, challenge? Or should we move on to... Yes, please. I agree with you about selecting for big cattle. That's not a way to improve efficiency. But is, is it the case that, in fact, people were worse than just selecting for high milk yield? They actually deliberately selected for high angularity and, and tall cows. So they made the problem even worse than selecting for, for just li for high milk yield. That's very true, yes. Uh, it was not only selecting by, uh, 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 but also because of the shows that we have, the large and most angular cows got number one in the shows. And the, the farmers with the more dual purpose cows were thinking, okay, I'm getting old fashioned here. Let's, uh, let's uh, use these bulls as well. If you put these cows on top on shows with more angularity, yeah, then uh, uh, you start brainwashing the, the farmer's population as well. When I started to do uh, scoring contests, I was called judging contests in Wageningen at university. I graduated there as well. We did we did a lot of uh, judging contests, and the first time I did it, the guy, the judge who was there to teach us, he said, because I did, made a total wrong ranking, of course, because of my own um, uh, thinking. He said, Harmon, listen carefully. A cow should be so sharp that you could cut a loaf of bread on her. <laughs> Remember that when you score a cow. He said. So I never forgot that, but that's, that's how we did it for a long time, and that's definitely influenced uh, the perception on farmers uh, for good cows. Thank you very much. Ah. Sorry, I can't resist this. Mike, could you stand next to Harmon? <laughs> and can we have this discussion about small and big animals? <laughs> and uh, do, do, we, do we prefer the, 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 the Scottish... Um, or, or the Dutch. <laughs> <laughs>